We are in Luke chapter 1 this morning, Luke chapter 1, as we continue in the thinking of the Christmas theme, um, we'll lead up because there won't be a message on Christmas Day, so it will lead up to the 18th. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to do a video. I, I just don't know if I'm going to do that as of yet, but there won't be preaching on that Sunday morning here for the service. But we're leading up in this thought, and, and I've been writing some about the, the thought that some of the things that Jesus said, some of the things that God the Father back in the, in the earlier times said, doesn't make sense. And people get upset at me for saying that sometimes, but sometimes you just think, why would you say that? And this is one of those verses that kind of just struck in my mind and led me to thinking about lots of different people in the scripture that has been given this kind of a position and it didn't mean anything of what we as human beings would think of. And so Luke chapter 1 verse 28, the angel comes and appears to Mary. That was the angel Gabriel that comes to Mary and, and talks to her about what is getting ready to happen in her life. And this is the comment that he leads into. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Now, I don't know about you, but immediately my thought goes to the thing of, hey, I would like for God to say to me, you are highly favored. That would be a pretty impressive thing. In fact, in the Old Testament time, if the king was to say to you, you are highly favored, you were kind of in a set position from that time forward because you was looked upon as somebody that was very significant and very important. So in, in just the surface, as Gabriel says to Mary, you are highly favored, you, you would think, wow, boy, this lady really has a great position in the kingdom of God. And she did, but it didn't mean necessarily what we would think that it meant. I thought of Gideon. I like the story of Gideon. Gideon was a man that was hiding in a cave and the angel comes to him and says to him, the Lord is with you, thou mighty man of valor. And I think this guy's hiding. He's hiding in a cave. He's, he's afraid. And rightfully so, the Midianites were coming and stealing all of the crop and, and the harvest and everything. They were doing that. And so Gideon was rightly afraid. And the angel comes to him and says, thou mighty man of valor. And then God sends him to fight thousands of Midianites with 300 men. How highly favored would you feel at that point in time? Sometimes in the ministry, it, it and, and I think I'm not just talking about pastoral ministry, I'm talking about anyone that is doing ministry at all. You, you can feel really outgunned. The, the other side has much more money usually than what we have. The churches struggle to try to make it. And the other side has people giving them millions and millions of dollars to carry out their agendas. And, and you can feel really outgunned. And so I think sometimes, you know, I, I kind of understand how Gideon felt when he was like, when he's like, are you serious? Are you really serious about this? I think I need to put out some fleeces to figure out whether this is really God that is telling me to do this because I'm going to take 300 men that are totally really unarmed. They just had pitchers and trumpets against mighty weapons of war. So how favored do you feel? You can say to me, well, God delivered him. He did, but would that have made you feel any better facing that circumstance. 
I would say to people, if it, does the fact that David defeated Goliath make you not afraid of the giants that you have to face in your life? Right? Does, does that give you that confidence inside for that reason we don't act like it quite often? Moses was certainly a man that was favored. The great I am calls him through a burning bush. They turned on him. They wanted to stone him. He makes the mistake, the mess up, as God has said to him, speak to the rock. And instead, he's frustrated with the people. Have you ever gotten frustrated with people around you before? If you haven't gotten frustrated, you're probably not spending any time around people. Because if you're around people, you're probably going to get frustrated. He was frustrated. And so he struck the rock. Well, God still delivered the water through the rock. God still brought the blessing and the provision. But Moses ended up not getting to go to the promised land because of his actions and his decisions. So how favored does that make you? Paul in Acts chapter 9, Jesus cared so much about Paul that he didn't even send an angel. He came personally to Paul. He said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And he had said to Ananias a little bit later, the man that comes to pray for Paul, that's in, that's in verses 15 to 16 in chapter 9. For he is a chosen vessel unto me, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He's a chosen vessel, and this is what he's going to suffer through. See, we, we do, we, and, and that's one of the things that I, I know I'm kind of bad for calling them charlatans, but that's the word that I come up with in that. These people that tell you if you're just a good enough Christian, if you have just enough faith, if you believe in God the way that you should, and of course, as was said earlier, if you make sure and send me a great big offering in the mail, then you will have everything that you want. That's what Christianity is about. Then people start to walk with God and they find out it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Because things don't always work out the way that you think that they're going to. Paul was stoned, left for dead. He was put in terrible prisons. He was beaten and all of these things that he went through and he was a chosen vessel for God. See, we've got to begin to understand that just because we are Christians does not make us not ever go through any struggles. Because if we believe that lie, we will soon lose our faith. Because when things don't work out the way we think they should, then we will say, well, God doesn't do what he says he will do. But the whole Bible is clear full of these things. One more before I get to the theme of what we're looking at today. David was paid one of the greatest compliments that I think a person could receive. I have said I don't deserve it, but I have said I would love for that to be on my tombstone. I, this, is, this was a man after my own heart. What a great thing for God to say about someone. Now, I'm not saying because David brought a lot of these things on himself. I, I know that. And, and so I'm not saying that, but, but he was a man after God's own heart, but he fought battle after battle after battle. His son turned on him. His king turned on him. He went through just all kinds of circumstances in his life. So let's look. As the angel says to Mary, you are a woman that is highly favored. Mary had to have been misunderstood by her hometown. She, she was questioned by her fiance that she was engaged to. He said that he would put her away privately because she was sinful. Now you say she wasn't sinful. Just imagine this. Imagine that you are married. Some of you are. Some of you aren't. I, I don't know in some of your cases whether you are or not. But let just say that you are married and your spouse comes to you and says, I'm going to have a baby. It belongs to the Holy Spirit. 
Sure. <laughs> sure, I believe that. Absolutely. I, I believe that it was it, yet Joseph, until the angel comes to Joseph, Joseph has no supernatural revelation of anything. And so his engaged bride says to him, I am going to have a child. Joseph knows that he wasn't the father of the child. And so she goes on to say the child was given to me by God. That that's she she faced tremendous circumstances against her. She spends six months away from home caring for a pregnant relative, which is Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Probably the reason that she went away like that was because she would have been an outcast. Then she gets the wonderful experience while she is ready to deliver a baby of being put on a donkey and ridden into Bethlehem on a donkey. I think my wife still loved me when she was in her labor time. I think she did. Sometimes I wondered because she wasn't feeling well and it wasn't good and she wasn't comfortable. And, and so I'm sitting there by the bed trying to do what they teach in the Lamaze class, which is breathe. And you have all these different breathing techniques. Boy, she was really happy about me telling her to do that in the middle of her pain and all of that kind of thing. Mary's riding on a donkey all the way to Bethlehem. It had to have been just a tremendously uncomfortable position to be put in. Then she doesn't get the comfort of having her baby at home. She has her baby in a stable because there was no room in the end for her to have it in the room. Then after all of that happens, they have to flee for their life and the life of their baby into Egypt, which would be enemy territory for an Israeli. They had to flee into Egypt because all of the children, the little boys are being slaughtered because of their baby, because they're trying to kill Jesus. Can you imagine the guilt of feeling that, of saying, wow, it was because of us that all of this happened, all of the weeping and the bloodshed and all of those things. How highly favored do you feel at that point in time? Then she has to stand by and watch her innocent son that she knows is innocent. She knew he was innocent and she has to stand by and watch him slaughtered not only on the cross, but beaten to almost beyond recognition. She, how highly favored do you feel? Even Jesus himself, as the Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then he goes to the cross. What does it mean when God says that you are highly favored? Again, what we assume so often and what people have tried to develop into this false theology about things is that we assume that that makes the person someone that is above human, that they are exalted above human. But that isn't what God is saying at all when he says to you, you are highly favored. It wasn't what he was saying to Mary that she was highly favored. It, it throws our faith sometimes when we face these circumstances that we go through, even after God says these wonderful things to us. We've been brought into an era of prosperity preaching where God's way is success and power and wealth and health. But really, that isn't what his word teaches us. Because God's idea of prospering and being favored is to be of use to him and not what it does for us in the physical realm. It is that we become useful to him in his kingdom. All of those people that I called off to you all the way down through the list were, were warriors 
for the kingdom of God. All the way down through them, they became people that were significant that we still talk about to this day, but it wasn't because they didn't go through struggles. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It's our purpose to bring glory to him, not to bring glory to ourselves. That's one of my greatest frustrations that I look at in, in our Christian system of doing things today. So much of the things is about bringing glory to ourselves. Ministers don't even care about their people anymore. I've sat with them. I've been in the ministerial meetings. I've, I've listened to them talk and mock their people and make fun of their people and then get up behind the pulpit on Sunday and claim to be preaching to them and caring for them. It is sad. But we are not in the place of, I, I think you said that, Roger, this is not a popularity contest. It, it is not for us to gain popularity. It is for us to tell the truth. And sometimes the truth is not easy to listen to. Sometimes the truth is not easy to preach. If you only knew how many times I have sat at the desk on Sunday morning, I haven't done that so much here because you guys didn't put me in that place to do that. But I've sat at the desk on Sunday mornings in different churches saying to God, I don't want to preach this. I don't want to preach this because I know if I preach this, I am not going to be a popular guy in the church by the time I get done with this message. But it is our job to bring the truth. We, we bring the truth and then you have to deal with that between you and God, not between you and me. And the reality is, is that struggles is a reality in our lives. James chapter one, verses two to three. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The word there for temptations is trials and tribulations. Count it all joy when you have struggles. Count it all joy when you go through these circumstances, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Boy, if you want to go into the struggle, folks, here's a good way. I'll tell you how you can go into the struggle. Start praying for patience. Because there's only one way that God can give you patience. And that's through struggles. You, you can't gain patience any other way. You will never gain patience on the mountaintop. You will never gain patience when everything is going right. It is when you are in the struggles that, but when patience has done what it is created to do, you will be perfect and entire wanting nothing. You will be at peace between you and God because you recognize that he is always leading you to the best place in your life. So was God lying when he sent the angel to Mary to say to her, you are highly favored? No, it just wasn't an easy pathway. But we used to say in leadership training, if you are on a pathway that has no obstacles, you are probably on the wrong pathway because if you want to grow in your life, obstacles are a reality. You, you must have them in order to grow. So you recognize that when God puts you into these situations, that he is doing a work in you that is much more valuable than anything that this earth would ever look at. Sometimes I admit it. They've told me through the years, and they actually teach you that when you're going through school to be a minister, not to show your vulnerability to the people that you minister to. And I have absolutely disobeyed that in every pathway. In every pathway, I show my vulnerability. Why? Because I think you need to know that your minister is vulnerable. I think that you need to know that your minister is not the rock of Gibraltar. Jesus is the rock. He's the only rock that you can lean on. Because if you trust in me, I will fail you. I promise you I will fail you. I'm not perfect. I blew their mind up at the restaurant the other day. 
because I was like, it would be great if I knew everything, but I don't. And because I don't know everything, that means that I can be wrong. So if you put your full 100% absolute confidence in me, that's a dangerous place to be. But God does know everything and you can count on him to always be leading you even through the struggles. There's been times that I have set, I'm, I'm 60 years old and I have not taken care of myself. I recognize that. I, I did not take care of myself at all and I paid the price for that. So I feel a lot older than what I am. I look a lot older than what I am. I, I'm just, I'm just, that's the truth. There's been times that I didn't understand what God was doing. I would make this statement to him. I trust you implicitly. I trust you without question, but I just don't understand what you're doing right now. Have you ever been in that situation? I sent a happy birthday to a man yesterday that I have literally known him. His, his two sons still call me their leader. And I won't tell you why that is. I'll just leave that for your imagination. But they still to this day, we were little children. So I have known this man since I was a little boy. Yesterday was his birthday. And on Facebook, I sent a happy birthday greeting to, to the dad of my two best friends when I was growing up. And then a little bit later, I read this thing. We appreciate all of the happy birthdays that you sent to our father today. This morning, he went to be with the Lord. And just like that, just like your world, their world, their world changed. Just, just like that on his birthday. Why would something like that happen? I, I trust God implicitly, but sometimes I just don't understand. But God has blessed me. Has he blessed you? I, I, I'm telling you, God has blessed me beyond measure. And so just because you go through the trials, just because you might feel like Gideon or Paul or David or Moses or Mary in, in the circumstances that you face, even though you might feel that way, don't forget that God is doing what will accomplish his plan in his kingdom. So when I say to him, why did you put me in Boone, Iowa? He doesn't owe me that explanation. Are, are you following what I'm saying? God has a purpose for what he is doing. And it is my job, it is my job to reflect him. I've used that terminology numerous, numerous times in messages. The moon has no light of its own. The moon is just a big rock in the sky. That's all it is. It has no fire, no, no light, no anything. The moon simply reflects what the sun shines off of it. The sun is some 400 times, I think anyway, I should have kept that note, but I think it's some 400 times bigger than what the moon is. It is massive and it burns and the light shines off of the sun and reflects off of this rock in the sky and gives us light. I have no light of my own, but God gives me light. And because of his light, I get the wonderful opportunity to go out and shine that light into this little community called Boone, Iowa. And I have grown to love Boone, Iowa with a real, real passion that isn't normal for me. I, I love it here. And I've got one of those guys, Roger, that has told me, well, you want to live to be 150. And I'm like, no, I don't even want to live to be 70. I want to die. And he's like, well, why would you want to die when you die? It's all over. It's all, there's nothing after that. It's all over. And it's like, no, it's just getting started. It's just getting started. 
when when we take in that last breath it's just getting started then we will have eternity one place or the other we will have eternity as we were talking in Sunday school class I found myself several times sitting back there in the back just cringing because I thought how many people do I know right now that if they died today would not be ready so in this time in this time of the holidays when we celebrate the happiness and the joy of the birth of our Savior and all of those things that comes with that I think that we should stop and think God let me be a reflection for you into this lost and dying world that people might be saved and when I stand up to do their funeral I never have to say they weren't ready I, I want everybody to be ready father I pray that we would realize today the the awesome thing because you show favor to all of us you you show favor beyond anything that we deserve you you show favor to us you bring blessings to us I got up this morning I was able to stand on my legs I was able to walk around and do all of the things that I needed to do all of this was your blessing you you show favor to us and we owe you all of our praises and all of our glory I fully recognize that I have no light to shine but you and so you are the light of the world and I'm just a reflection of you let us all be a reflection of you into the world around us that we could bring not our influence into the world but that we could bring your influence into the world thank you for all of these people that you gave us as examples that we can learn from and grow from and be strengthened in our relationship with you we praise you for this opportunity and for everyone that is here they don't know what a great blessing it is to look out upon people here today and I'm thankful for every single one of them I praise you for them help us as we go through the week and we promise that we praise you and thank you for all that you do in Jesus name Amen thank you for listening God bless you